make your C++ cross-platform. If you uh, notice in the, um, the schedule, it says how and why, but I'm going to be focusing more on the why, if you'll indulge me. I, I, there, I don't believe I'm amplified. <clears throat> so I'll just try to speak louder then. So my name is Jason Turner. Um, these are some of the projects that I've been working on. ChaiScript is a scripting language that's open source and free. CBB Best Practices is a, um, it's a uh, forkable coding standards document that you can use for your own organization. It's on GitHub. Do whatever you want to with it. And that's me. I am now the co-host of CBPcast. And if you haven't heard of it, we're having fun doing some C++ podcasting. I'm an independent contractor. I've been developing in C++ now for 13 years professionally, and which leads us to the point of this talk. Basically, every single line of code that I've ever had to write in C++ has had to run on at least two platforms. Uh, that's ChaiScript. Whenever I mention it, people ask about it. So this is a complete example, except for the include files. You uh, are exposing a function called do something to the scripting engine, and then calling it on the last line, passing the plus operator in, which is automatically converted to a std function and type safe, and it's, it's cool. Anyhow, these are some of the platforms that I've worked on. All of them, except for FreeBSD and Haiku, have been work that I was paid to do. That's, like I said, everything that I've touched has had to work on more than one platform. So over the past five years, I've been working with a team that makes bi-weekly releases of uh, <laughs> tools that have to run on Mac OS, Linux, and Windows, and they have to be easy and to install and feel like natural applications on the respective platforms. And just to keep things exciting, we also build a set of Ruby bindings with Swig and deploy them on all three OSs as well. <coughs> so today, I'm going to in the next 35 minutes, convince you that all of your C++ applications should be cross-platform if they're not today. I'll give you some advice to help you convince your coworkers, and some advice on how to actually get the code cross-platform. Cross-platform code is better. It's more standards compliant, safer. I like to say future resistant because future proof would be awfully strong here, but it, it helps. It's more organized, you have more tools available customer base, we'll, we'll get to these. So to get to the point of better, which is what I'm going to approach first, you can't, uh, you can't get there unless you're using multiple, multiple compilers on multiple platforms from multiple vendors. If you use Clang on Windows and MSV on, MSVC on Windows, you're not going to get the full advantage. You need GCC on Linux, Clang on Windows, whatever you want to do. Just multiple compilers, multiple platforms. And I'll try to not speak too quickly through the presentation. <laughs> so, more standards compliant. Um, should be pretty obvious, anyone want to point out portability <laughs> issues here? <laughs> well, <laughs> exactly. So, including Windows.h, using a capital bool. So those are the obvious things. There's still an issue with this code that doesn't meet the current C++ standard. Plus plus of bool. Only Clang will warn you on that if you turn the warnings all the way up. Incrementing expression of type bool is deprecated. So only Clang on non-Windows specifically would find all those issues because you could use Clang and include Windows.h if you wanted to. Here is an example that I got while doing some refactoring of ChaiScript actually last week that has an issue. If anyone can find this one, someone's going to get it. You guess? Yeah, that's what I did. And interestingly, so match is both moved and used. I run 15 different builds on every single check-in that I make. Only Clang on Linux crashed. None of my static analyzers, none of my other compilers even generated a warning on that code. Can you go back? Yes. Is it possible? I'm sure that this is an error that it should crash. It's not. It's because it 
it's an unspecified but valid state. It's an unspecified, yes. Uh, I was asked if, uh, if it, I'm sure it's an error. It is true that it is an unspecified but valid state, but I think we can all agree that this is code that I shouldn't have written. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because it's unspecified in the standard. Ex yes, is it possible that the uh, compiler would have called build int before calling std move? Yes, it's unspecified. So that's part of my point here is by using more tools on more platforms, we kind of get to sift out the unspecified behavior. Yes? Move doesn't actually do anything. So it's when you It's up to the function call, yes. Reference, which, and the thing that you're passing it to must be called after build int. Yeah. yeah. Well? What was that? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, that build int had to be called before um, the constructor, or excuse me, before the function call to make node, because std move doesn't actually do anything. The only case that would happen is if you're passing by a value, it needs to call move constructor, which then the ordering is unspecified. Right, and I believe in this case I actually am using the pass by value and then move idiom on the constructor. Because this is a uh, make node uh, forwards to constructor. Yes. Okay. Right. So my point still stands that only by using all of the tools that I had available did I sort out this not good code that I shouldn't have written in the first place. Yes. Why did it crash? It was crashing on st uh, memory access violation and string. On, on, uh, on every build that I made on Kling, it was. But only on Kling. All right. This code, um, I'm going to say this is safer. This is, this is an example from a Google research blog posting that uh, is discussing that it says basically all binary search algorithms are broken, is the topic of this blog post. And this uh, is broken, but it generates no warnings whatsoever on GCC on Linux. Anyone? Yes? I've seen this before, but signed integer overflow? Yes. Um, but, uh, that and, and more, yes. Uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Signed, <laughs> signed integer overflow was the, uh, was the comment. And there's, there's that. Uh, but it's, everything is related to that category of problem. So if we have, um, all right, so what is the size of integer? At least 16 bits. Right. It's unspecified. But in a practical standpoint, every platform that I looked at, int, int is 32-bit. I know it's unspecified by the standard, but every platform that I worked on, uh, that I tested, it was 32-bit. And the size of size t, or the size that a vector can hold, is 64-bit on every 64-bit platform that I tested. So we've got, um, well, we have a problem if we have more than 2 billion objects, and this is code that is happening in the real world now. GCC doesn't warn. I could not convince it to warn, even though we have potential for uh, Truncating the size of the vector here, we have integer overflow potential here. Uh, you can get Clang to warn on it, again, if you turn the warnings all the way up. But Visual Studio and 64-bit builds with a warning level 3, which it's my personal opinion, if you're using Visual Studio, you should at least be on W3, if not W4. It complains all over the place. Visual Studio hates code like this, where you're passing 64-bit into 32-bit things. <coughs> and it's right to complain, so that we're not uh, accidentally, I think in this case, well, yeah, I mean, we would have been limiting it to certainly no more than 2 billion objects. <coughs> Excuse me. So summary. Uh, MSVC is the only one that really likes to complain about it. And uh, projects that I work on with my clients, we find this to be a big annoyance when we started compiling on 64-bit windows. But it, they're right to be complaining. This code, 
probably make some people cringe. Anyone? <laughs> I you see it. <laughs> yeah. What's that? Right, a non-const reference to a temporary. Visual Studio allows this. When? I thought I tried it in 2015 and it still allowed it. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, so the comment was made that Visual Studio 2015 should have fixed it, but I, I didn't think they did. So this code won't compile on anything besides Visual <laughs> Studio and definitely up to 2013, no question. And at warning level four, you get a warning uh, saying that you're doing something that doesn't match the standard. But this code is, you shouldn't be doing this. There's no good reason to be doing this, but if you're, if you're uh, centralized on, on Visual Studio development, you might accidentally have code like this. We did uh, in the project I was working on. And, and, but I'm primary a Linux developer, so it was very easy for me to catch it when the other guys would check it in. I would immediately try to build and it wouldn't work. So it was <laughs> pretty, pretty quick to test it. Uh, yes. So cross-platform code is more organized. Um, this might be obvious, but you, you should have your OS-specific code separated out from your logic and whatever, the rest of your system. If you don't, you're going to end up with lots of really fun, conditionally compiled code interspersed throughout your library or in UI. <coughs> Cross-platform gives you many more tools available. Uh, again, I know, I, I, feel, I, I get the impression that with uh, C++ 11 and 14 and people playing with 17, that uh, Visual Studio has been kind of sidelined by the people who want to push uh, their C++ usage, but let's not ignore Windows. PVS Studios and ReSharper are both commercial project, uh, products, but they're they're good static analysis tools uh, and refactoring tools. Volgrind, if you're on Windows only, you're missing out on being able to do some runtime analysis of your code. Has everyone heard of Volgrind? No? Okay, yes, all right. Uh, Visual Studio Static Analyzer is actually quite good, and I'll give an example of that uh, in a second here. And Clang Sanitizers, if you haven't used them, are great for runtime analysis, also giving you basically the same functionality as Volgrind. Yes? Is there a reason why Coverity tools are not there? I, just, uh, there's a reason Coverity tools are not there. It's just my lack of experience. I haven't used them. And, and this is, I mean, there are thousands of tools I could have put up here. Yes? Have you used Clang uh, Static Analyzer as well? Yeah, yes, I didn't put it on there. Have I used Clang Static Analyzer? Yes, I have. I don't currently have it as part of my automated build process, but uh, yes, I was just double checking my code against it last week, actually. So this example um, has some useless code in it. Anyone? Throw at the end is pointless. Interestingly, again, why Visual Studio is useful, only Visual Studio Static Analyzer caught that. This is an obviously contrived example, but I've seen code similar to it after some refactoring where you accidentally have the if and the else block do exactly the same thing because you, whatever, you change some stuff around, it definitely happens. So CPP check, which is another tool that wasn't on the last slide, it's cross-platform free, but just a little, you know, trying to make a point here about static analysis and making the most use of your tools. CVP check is able to tell you, oops, you have duplicate branches for your if and your else block. Uh, any conclusion on Visual Studio 2015 yet? So it still only warns on it. Okay, Visual Studio 2015 still only warns on passing a temporary to a non-const reference. This is obvious. If you're able to support multiple platforms, you have more potential customers. I've been noticing a lot of Linux games on Humble Bundle now. Granted, if you are a game developer, you're already thinking about these things, but I just wanted to throw it out there. That the, there's a lot of 
you know, maybe customers were not thinking about. So we're going to talk about some guidelines now for uh, how to make this whole process easier. And I'm curious, is everyone here use some sort of build generating tool, CMake or uh, B code? There's, is anyone from B code here, just out of curiosity? Hey, there you are. Um, is everyone using a build tool, or do you tend to use? Plain What's that? Plain make. Plain make. Plain. Oh, plain make. Plain make. That's what you use is plain make. Yeah. Um, that will definitely make it harder to support other platforms. Uh, CMake doesn't have yes, lots of CMake people. Okay. Uh, these last two, Premake, Misan, are ones I only recently became aware of, but they're similar to CMake in that they generate um, the project file that's appropriate for the platform that you're compiling on. And I'm sure there's some Qt developers, Qt developers here. Uh, there's like a contingent just in that corner. That's interesting. <laughs> so if you're not using a build tool, you are making your life harder than it should be. And since I'm trying to convince you that all of your C++ should be cross-platform, I'm going to suggest that we should all be using build tools no matter what platforms we're on. You uh, are going to have to choose what compilers you want to support if you are thinking about cross-platform compatibility. Everyone, every compiler is going to have some issue that you're not going to like. As we all know, Visual Studio 2013, limited C++ 11 support, ConstExpr does nothing, uh, no throw doesn't exist. I, you are unable to default um, uh, move constructors, I believe, which I found slightly annoying recently. They don't have magic statics. GCC 4.6 complains if your Lambda contains more than just a return type, uh, just a return statement in it. Uh, but that, that only happens if you have um, warnings uh, pedantic turned on, which I do. My warning, I have lots of warning flags to make sure I'm catching as many things as I can on as many platforms as possible. And anything else that you can think of, I'm sure there's some compiler doesn't support it. So just a quick uh, note here that I have code that looks like this, so that if I'm compiling on... GCC 4.6, which doesn't have the override statement yet, then I can compile that away. If I'm compiling on Visual Studio, I make no throw, be a throw with empty, um, with no parameters. <coughs> const yeah, const expert, again, I have to compile that out, Visual Studio. <coughs> yes? Why compile const expert to nothing and not const? Why not make it const? Yes. You would have different meanings in the grammar at that point if you make it const. For instance, if I've got a const expert member function, I'm making the return value const now rather than making the function const expert. Uh, th the answer was it can change the meaning uh, based on the context of where the const expert showed up. Yes. Yeah, I believe that boost has a boost const expert or const. Oh. <laughs> so, so boost might have a macro that's const expert or const. Yes. Like that. Um, const expert doesn't imply const. Right, right. Const expert does not imply const. Yeah, so <laughs> um, there we go. If you're doing any GUI work, you um, you probably don't want to roll all of your own native GUI code for every platform that you might possibly want to support. So there's, again, incountably many of these. I focus on open source development, so I think about open source and freely available options. WX widgets, if you're not familiar with it, um, wraps the native GUI components on each respective platform when it can. So everything has a native look and feel no matter what platform you're running on. But in my opinion, it's, um, 
not terribly modern C++. So for those of us who are used to working in the C++11 moving forward world, we get frustrated there. GTKMM is a C++ wrapper around the GIMP toolkit, um, which defines all of its own widgets on each platform. It, um, it is more modern C++ and makes me happier to use it, but it's also harder to deploy because, well, on crass platform builds, I found it harder to deploy. And Qt's the big guy that everyone's heard of. <clears throat> so just uh, for some eye candy here, one of the projects that I've been working on, um, this, the Windows toolbar gives us a way as being the Windows app, uh, the Windows build of it, but we, Windows, and that's Linux, and that one is Mac OS, you can tell because there's no window decorations on it. It was in full screen mode there, I think. Is that right? Yeah, that's gotta be right. Um, so, you know, we, we try to be native, but also give the same look and feel on every platform. And this particular project uses Qt with uh, a lot of hand-rolled widgets. Um, and it's, you know, I'm not going to try to say that it's like trivially easy to support a bunch of platforms because like just trying to get all of these icons lined up correctly with the label fields so that it looked right on a bunch of different resolutions on a bunch of different platforms, it, it took four or five hours of tweaking like, I want you know one extra pixel right here. Okay, now it looks all right on every platform. So that's the kind of thing. I'm gonna get into downsides in a little bit. That's one of them. So uh, I feel like GUI is the obvious thing and file system access is the not obvious thing. The standard, you know, provides the ability to open and save files, basically. If you want to do anything else, like walk through a directory tree and get all of the files that are, that are on the file, you know, on a particular directory or say, is this file live on a network share or is it local or is it on a removable drive? You're not going to get that from the standard. You're going to want to use some other tool for that. Qt and WX widgets, again, they provide um, all kinds of file system library tools. I don't know if this is still an issue in Boost. Last time we checked, it was. Um, if your path, lane, path names get over 255 characters on Windows, it's using the wrong version of the Windows API. So you have a problem. Uh, we ended up, for some of our uses, had to switch to using, this particular project had both Qt, links to both Qt and Boost. So we have to, there's a couple of places where we have some inconsistencies in our file system access because, you know, I'm coding along in Boost and then find out in one case we had a problem and had to use Qt's version or whatever. There's a, uh, talk about the uh, stud file system potentially coming up. Has it been approved? It's a TS at the moment. So okay. Uh, it's available through, it's part of the, the, the Visual C++ product. It, I think it's in the top of tree of TCC at the moment. Okay. I think the client version is probably reasonably close. Right, so it's a TS at the moment and it's available on most platforms in one form or another? Uh, it's, it's available on Microsoft at the moment and it's in, in the Windows. trunk of the <coughs> Okay. <coughs> Yeah, and I mean, the TR1 version of that had been in Visual Studio for a very long time, I believe, uh, from what, like 2010 or something, I think. Now, I found that you'll never maintain your ability to have a cross-platform uh, application without some form of automated build helping you out. How many people have code hosted on GitHub? Excellent. How many people are using Travis for automated builds? That's good. Anyone using AppVayor? All right, that's like three people now. AppVayor's Windows builds, automated <laughs> builds, works almost exactly like Travis. You can set up a appvayor.yaml file in the root of your repository, hook it up with GitHub, every commit you make, it makes builds. So there's 
no reason to not be using this. It has, um, it has support for Visual Studio 2015 release candidate now. They just rolled out, so you can choose that image and use it. You can roll your own, and I have to mention um, uh, my a decent CI, it's a decentralized, we needed a tool that, that would work well behind a firewall, and uh, Hudson and Jenkins and most of the others uh, want to be able to talk, they want to be able to receive push notifications from GitHub, ideally, and that doesn't work very well behind a firewall. So I rolled this tool, it's a couple thousand lines of Ruby code, it's, it's fun. Um, it just does pulls on uh, polls, excuse me, it pulls your GitHub repository, looks to see if you've done anything recently, and builds. Team City works really well, too. What's that? Team City works really well. Team City, I've heard people talk about that, yeah. So if it's possible, I am going to try to switch over to a live web page here. All right. This is my build dashboard for ChaiScript. So I do, for every check-in, builds against 64-bit and 32-bit Windows, uh, Visual Studio 2013 and 2015, Clang 3.5, um, Clang's address sanitizer, thread sanitizer, libc++, CVB check 1.67, my Mac, build machine went to sleep, so these guys are out of date, but, what's that? Sure. <laughs> I seem, I, 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 I lost my pointer in the, during the keynote somehow, I don't know how that happened. So, uh, yeah, my Mac builds are out of date here, you can see. Um, so with this automated build system, or with any automated build system, what you get is an advantage as something of an automated uh, code review process. So this uh, is a pull request that I just created for myself that is intentionally broken um, this morning to see GitHub. <laughs> if you guys haven't seen this multiple build status thing on GitHub, I, I really like it. So you can see all of the builds. So that's 14 of them. My two Mac ones didn't show up, so I would have had 16 total. But for every build, I get a report from CPP check automatically telling me that I have an issue I can click on. And it will nicely highlight for me that I am using I uninitialized. Uh, so, I mean, you can check that tool out. No one outside of our organization is using it. Um, so I can't make any promises, but more to the point is get your automated build going on for as many platforms as you possibly can. Take advantage of as many tools as you possibly can to make your code better. So, assuming I've already convinced all you guys that you need to be doing cross-platform development on every single project that you're working on, you... Um, might have to convince the rest of your team. You are welcome to download the slide deck, show them some of the examples for cases that are only caught on specific compilers and on specific platforms. <coughs> Try to extract some of the core functionality from your system. Now just uh, maybe an opinionated comment here, but if you have a hard time pulling out some core functionality of your library that is not OS dependent, you probably need to refactor your program. Uh, it's CMake is a bit of a pain, but also pretty easy to get started with. So you could set up a quick CMake stub that just compiles a couple of files that you're concerned about. And then uh, demonstrate to your team what, the, uh, what this new compiler that you just <coughs> exposed finds. And if your team isn't convinced, doing this will get you about 90% of the way there of having builds on multiple platforms. You just have to make full use of what you've got available. Make sure, um, 
So uh, to clarify, I mean, you can, in some cases, specify either dash or slash for parameters for, for cl.exe, I believe. Um, I'm not, I, I, I don't recommend w all on MSVC, yes? So if you turn up all the warnings, please make sure you're using recent compilers. We still have GCC 412 in our build for build system, and that's got a lot of false positives. Yes, if, you, if you're going to turn the warnings all the way up, make sure you're using a recent compiler. That is very true. Um, I, I have a rule personally that we that I go with W all and W extra on um, GCC. W four on MSVC. The only warning that I add on top of W four on MSVC is the um, uh, uh, the warning that warns you that static initialization is not thread safe because they didn't have magic static support in 2013, but they do now in 2015. But that warning still shows up. <laughs> you have to specifically enable whatever the warning number is, 4660 or something like that. It will be fixed. <laughs> I submitted a frowny face in the Visual Studio IDE about that, but I haven't heard back. Okay, okay. Okay, so uh, they're saying it will be fixed, that that warning will go away since it's no longer appropriate. Uh, w everything is, um, oh, I was going to say, I don't recommend W all in MSVC because it likes <laughs> to generate warnings from standard library headers, which can really get annoying. And W everything on Clang can produce a lot of output also. So I, in my personal stuff, I've selectively like I do W everything and then I've selectively disabled like six warnings. I, I don't remember what six they are. Make sure you're using the static analysis available to you. GCC doesn't have it, but CVP check, free, works on all three platforms. It has a Visual Studio plugin. It's awesome. Uh, I think I've, I've had like one false positive from PP, CPP check. Make sure you're using the static analysis again on MSVC and Clang. Preferably roll this into your automated build process. If you're not right now, add slash analyze to your command line parameters in your automated build environment. I did notice the Visual Studio 2013 and analyze is really slow, but Visual Studio 2015 seems to be much faster with analyze mode turned on. So that's good. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> um, and I have some of these things on the CBP best practices um, uh, coding standards forkable document that you guys can look at if you want to. All right, I have to talk about downsides to be fair. Um, you have to pick a subset of the language that you use. Even if you use the latest compiler from every vendor today and the betas, you're still not going to have every feature of C++14 and not even every feature of C++ 11, I don't think. There's still something that's going to be left out of Visual <coughs> Studio. Is, is 2015 expected out of every feature of C++ 11 by the time it launches? Well, not everything from C++ 98. Not everything from C++ 98. Okay. What's that? Oh, two-phase lookup? Okay. Preprocessor And the preprocessor is not compliant, apparently. And it doesn't do value <laughs> initialization. <laughs> so um, yes, you have to pick a subset of the language that you're going to support if you want your library to be fully supported on every platform. You have to pick a subset of OS and GUI functionality. Uh, the best thing that I could think of for OS functionality is, say for some reason you have your tool um, your, your application wants to do background work when the overall system load is below a certain threshold. Detecting the system load on every platform is going to be a pain in the butt, but it's possible. You just, you know, it's something to have to deal with. And then I have this ambiguous unexpected differences, and that's all of the things that you wouldn't expect, like this. We ended up, and granted this is poor design on our part, but we ended up with a, a situation like this, where we have a static logger with a static singleton in it that was statically linked into three different libraries. 
lib1, lib2, lib3. And they all are using swig generated Ruby bindings. And they are all dynamically loaded at runtime from Ruby. Um, if anyone has had to deal with these issues, you might guess that we had ended up with a problem here. On Linux, we had one logger, which is what we expected. The runtime merged all of them together, and it was nice. On Windows, we had three different instances of the logger, which is annoying, but still worked. On Mac, we had one logger that was freed three times at the exit <laughs> of the Ruby executable. Now, um, to, if you remove uh, this line down here, so take away the Ruby part, from here up, uh, these are the same libraries that were used in our executable. We didn't have a problem when these libraries were dynamically linked into our executable. We only had a problem once we started, once we started uh, dynamically loading the libraries from Ruby and only on shutdown of the Ruby interpreter on Mac OS. I think it took me a week to figure out what was going on. So um, I had just some little notes here. Uh, Try to link a static library into your project at most one time. Um, try to avoid singletons, especially if you're on Visual Studio 2013, since it doesn't have magic statics, and making a singleton that's thread safe uh, initialization on Visual Studio 2013 is extremely difficult and annoying. Um, just in general, prefer dynamic or static when you're building your project. And this is the other downside is this is a direct copy of code from ChiScript. Um, I have Visual Studio 2013 static analyzer thought that I was using this types vector without first checking the length of it and it was wrong. So I basically ended up with seven lines of preprocessor code, two lines of comments because of one line. But it's, uh, TypeScript is a header only, it's a header only library. And so uh, I I'm, have a very um, stringent requirement that I don't generate any warnings or static analysis problems that might spill over into the user's code. And that's it, any other questions? That's my dog, if you've seen her around the campus. She's raising her hand. Um, yes. Okay. I'm curious if you had these same problems and what did you, how did you, how did you uh, solve it and have you ever used boost process? I have, uh, the question was whether or not I've used boost process uh, to deal with uh, the problem of monitoring processes on multiple platforms. I have not, but I have used queue process for that exact, exact same situation. Because this code we're talking about here actually um, spools off many, um, uh, calls to Energy Plus, which is a building energy simulation program. It's sort of standalone executable. And yes, I've had to deal with that. Uh, queue process did a very good job, but in some cases on Windows, it couldn't, de no, on Linux, it couldn't detect if the process was zombied or something, and I had to do a workaround in queue process. That's definitely a hard problem, and it's, it's definitely in the category of things that makes us harder. Yes? I'm sorry, uh, uh, is there, I didn't catch the first part of your question. What other option? MinGW. Oh, MinGW, uh, yes. Uh, do we use MinGW? Why do we stick with Visual Studio? Um, if, if you're going to be a, uh, if you're gonna be a good citizen on the platform, if you wanna say you really support Windows, then I feel like you have to support Visual Studio because your users are using Visual Studio, or people that want to consume your library are planning to use Visual Studio. If they can't link to your library in Visual Studio, then the, you, I, you haven't really gone anywhere, I don't think. But yes, we have used MinGW for some things, and I'm basically out of time, so. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah, so a lot of people are using MinGW via Qt create. That's, yeah. Uh, Q, uh, Qt's uh, cross-platform uh, GUI is, is, handly, uh, is, is handy, and it is possibly moving to more people using GCC on Windows also. I think I'm out of time now. Is that correct? All right. Thank you.